Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Honorable Defense Minister Pari Karsai, Ambassador Prasad, a good friend of Afghanistan and my very good friend, uh, Janab Hussain, Sheikh Al Islam Saib, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, let me thank Ambassador Prasad for his kind invitation uh, for me to attend this important conference. It's an honor to be one of the speakers at a conference that is dealing with the most defining challenge of our time, security and counterterrorism. Let me congratulate Ambassador Prasad, his colleagues, and the Indian government for creating this forum, a genuine and effective forum, not just for our region, but also for the global community, to hold honest and open discussions about the threats to our societies, our nations, and the way, the ways in which we can get together to neutralize these threats. It's all the more important that this is held in India because of its international credentials to respect norms and our shared values. It gives us a level of comfort to hold those discussions in good faith and with the understanding that they will be translated into good policies. Colleagues, let me also take this opportunity to thank the incredible India, its great people, and its government for its strong friendship, generous support, and reliable partnership with Afghanistan. I know, Ambassador, I personally am grateful to you for the way you contributed to strengthen this partnership. I'm honored to have my honorable colleague, Defense Minister here, who has been a key leader to continue to contribute to the friendship of the two nations. Just a few months ago, our President was here, I suppose right in this room, when he thanked every Indian for his or her one dollar contribution to Afghanistan. Well, first of all, a billion dollars from India as a contribution to rebuild Afghanistan is extremely important. It's quite a lot of money. But more than that, it represents the goodwill of an honorable nation that honors friendship and values solidarity with a nation like Afghanistan that has been the frontline country against our common enemies and threats. So thank you for all of that. Honorable Minister, I have a speech that may be rather long, so I do understand the daily pressing priorities of a security minister. Please feel free whenever you decide to leave. I won't mind, but I must say that does not apply to everybody else in the room. <laughs> I was thinking of speaking only about Afghanistan today because it's a context that is extremely important and relevant to the themes of this conference and more importantly to the security of Asia, our region and the global community. And I was hoping to offer a few perspectives. But before I do that, 
the first question I would like to answer is why does Afghanistan matter? First of all, we share a region with Pakistan and other neighboring countries that has had the highest concentration of organized terrorists anywhere in the world. According to known statistics, 20 out of 98 U.S. designated terrorist organizations are operating in that region. They're operating there, not all of them with the Afghan objectives alone. They have goals beyond Afghanistan. Why is Afghanistan important for them? It's because that is the place they see as a breeding ground, as a sanctuary, where they launched or from where they launched the 9-11 attack. And that is the place where they would like to do the same thing again. For that reason, you have this highest concentration of the world's most lethal terrorist organizations. What enables them to be there? It's proven sanctuaries for them. It's the symbiotic relation that they have with state and non-state actors. And it's this critical support and en enabling infrastructure that they enjoy. Success in Afghanistan against terrorism is vitally important for the security of our region and global community. Unfortunately, the reverse is also true. Failure in Afghanistan is the failure of the region and the global community in their own effort to secure their nations. There are lessons to be learned from Afghanistan experience. There are many. I wouldn't provide an exhaustive list of such lessons, but there's one that I would definitely highlight, and that is we as the region have a common enemy now, but unfortunately we do not have a common strategy to defeat it. In this context, let me offer four key points to summarize our perspectives to the debate that we are going to have over the coming two days. The first point, terrorism is morphing and adapting in this region to pursue its goals beyond Afghanistan. Since 9-11, they have established a distinctive ecology, system, and industry. We are no longer talking about lone wolf or a violent terrorist organization. There is a symbiotic axis of three critical actors. First, violent extremists, second, criminal economics, and third, state sponsorship of terrorism. Friends, we are faced by this symbiotic axis of three enemies of humanity that have come together to threaten security of every nation in this region and by extension the world community. How do they play out in Afghanistan? Let me focus first on the violent groups. There are four groups of extremist terrorist organizations that we continue to fight. Group one includes the Afghan terrorists. 
including Taliban and the Haqqani network. We were successfully able to negotiate a peace agreement with a third group, the Hizb Islami. Second is the Pakistani terrorist groups, including the lashkar e taiba jaysh e muhammad and the tahrik e taliban e pakistan the third group of such networks are regional and that includes the islamic movement so called islamic movement of uzbekistan the east turkestan islamic movement of china ansarullah and jindullah finally the fourth group is the one that is very well known and talked about including al qaeda and daesh but what is important about these groups that they have two sets of relations that are symbiotic first among themselves they need each other they need afghan terrorists in order to be able to come to afghanistan and the afghan terrorists need them for finance technology and training but they all need two other sets of relationships one with rogue state elements that provide them sanctuaries or at least tolerate them and second with criminal economic networks including the drugs let's be fair about this assessment colleagues sometimes we wonder whether this their war is about politics or economics or a combination of both the drug industry and criminal economy produces such an amount of resources that they can easily use to finance both state and non-state actors to pursue terrorist goals and there's also a personal accountability issue here operators involved in the drug industry may hardly listen to the policy makers and these sorts of relationships actually makes it possible for them to sustain their operations considering these facts ladies and gentlemen allow me to try to dispel three important myths that are commonly held about terrorism and the war in afghanistan first the first myth is for those who argue that the war in afghanistan is a civil war it's not it's a drug war it's a violent terrorist war and it's unfortunately undeclared state to state war a combination of all of this can easily be demonstrated by the multiplicity of the actors on the ground sustaining this war second the second myth is those who believe that the distinction between good and bad terrorists will bring them security and will enable them to pursue their goals without being affected themselves we've seen this that making such a distinction can actually change a perpetrator to a victim as well because such terrorist organizations are capable of morphing themselves into frankenstein monsters and they will come after their own masters the third myth 
is associating such terrorism with Islam. It's absolutely untrue. Let me offer three reasons why this is unhelpful. First, technically associating terrorism with Islam is wrong because it will deprive us of a true understanding of what terrorism is and what it stands for. It is misleading. Second, ethically it is inappropriate to associate terrorism with Islam because it fails to understand, to appreciate the sacrifices that the Muslims are making in order to defeat terrorism and the suffering that the Muslims have had at the hands of the terrorists. No, Mus no Muslim nation is losing more innocent lives to terrorism than Afghanistan. But collectively, the Muslim world is losing more people to terrorism than any other civilization. Third, politically associating terrorism with Islam is unwise because they are losing a natural ally that is more invested in counterterrorism than any other ally you may have. Afghanistan is a good case in point. Our friendship with the United States, with NATO, and with India, and with the rest of the Muslim world to fight terrorism, a common enemy, is indeed a testament to the fact that Muslims are your reliable partners in defeating extremist ideologies that has nothing to do with Islam. This understanding is important for shaping policies. The conference is about how to contribute to a policy environment in which sound judgment is exercised in identifying the threats and appropriate and effective strategies. With this understanding, we will be much better placed to shape both our counterterrorism strategies and peace and reconciliation. This brings me to a second point, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make. And that is the irony. Despite the international investment in counterterrorism, terrorism is growing its capabilities and its presence in, a, in the Afghan-Pakistan region. Because they have sanctuaries, because they have financing, recruitment, training, and equipment facilities. In Afghanistan, we estimate their number between 40 to 45,000 terrorist soldiers that have been deployed in the region. One fourth of them are foreigners. They are not from the region. And that makes it extremely difficult for us to decide who to make peace with and who to fight. We cannot make peace with these foreigners. They are not Afghans. And we will have to think of a different strategy together with you. Because these foreigners are coming not just from the countries in the region, but also from the rest of the world. There has been a displacement effect. The operation by the Pakistani army called Zarb-e-Azm and the pressures 
on ISIL, Daesh, Al Qaeda, elsewhere in the Middle East, have had displacement effect. That's why you have such a high concentration of these terrorist organizations in Afghanistan. As I said earlier, these networks have their individual goals to pursue. However, they have one thing in common, and that is the destruction of the state in Afghanistan so that they can establish a sanctuary. But let me tell you, colleagues, that if you study these individual networks, there's hardly any country in this region that does not have an enemy among them. Al-Qaeda and Daesh will be the enemy of every one of us, not just the West not just the United States. lashkar e taiba and jaysh e Muhammad is aimed to hurt India. Actors such as IMU and ATIM are planning to threaten China, Russia and Central Asia. While there are Pakistani-based terrorist networks threatening Afghanistan and the rest of us, but TTP and its splinter groups are actually waging violence in Pakistan against innocent people. One thing we all need to acknowledge, we do not have any friend among them. If anything, every one of us have an enemy among them. It's important for our common understanding and common policy. For Afghanistan, it has been extremely costly. Over the past 14 months, we lost over 10,500 men and women, 25% of them civilians. Every day we are losing 28 Afghans to terrorism on average. If you combine it with the wounded, every day we are losing 81 people on average. It's a very high cost. Despite that high cost, we are still holding our ground. And let me take this opportunity to thank the United States, our NATO partners, India, and our other regional partners, including China and Russia and Iran, for their continued support to this noble struggle. Some would argue that we have a stalemate, as our president responded. Yes, we do. Well, we are having that stalemate made with one-tenth of the international soldiers that we had between 2009 and 2014. So the Afghans, those who have been trained with your tax money and successfully, are now holding their ground successfully. However, my third point is worrying that the inadequacy of regional response to terrorism is actually making the challenge worse. Our regional response at best is inadequate. Why? Over the past two years, we have engaged all of our regional partners. And unfortunately, much to our disappointment, we are seeing a continued breakdown of regional consensus over terrorism. Whatever the reasons, some would cite their rivalries, disputes, and in incompatible interests strategically with global actors 
and try to translate that into their policies in Afghanistan and the region, frankly speaking, there is no justification for that. Because at the end, every one of us will lose. But what are these breaking consensus issues? The first one is that we all decided since 9-11 that there shouldn't be a distinction between good and bad terrorists. They're all terrorists, they're all bad. But unfortunately, recently, much to our disappointment, there are actors who are trying to justify that maybe this terrorist can be a partner against that terrorist. And normally that terrorist that they want to make a partner is the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqani network or the LAT and jaysh e Muhammad. We engaged these friends and said, number one, you do not have empirical evidence that the Taliban are the enemies of Daesh. Because they are mutating. Because the majority of Daesh in Afghanistan today are either Tahrik Taliban in Pakistan or Afghan Taliban. And number two, Anything you give them, they will use against us. And who are we to you? A friend or an enemy? We consider ourselves a friend. So the breakdown of that consensus is to the detriment of not just Afghanistan, but the entire region. One lesson that we have to all learn using a Frankenstein against another enemy is dangerous and for sure it's going to come after its must. Second breakdown in that consensus is the centrality of state to state relations for counterterrorism and cooperation. There are actors in our region who are trying to use non state actors in pursuit of their national security interests. That is wrong. There's no substitute to a state-to-state -state effective cooperation. And finally, the third point is when states decide that they want to have security for themselves no matter what happens to the others. That is wrong. We can either be collectively secure or we can be collectively insecure. We have to decide. Finally, my fourth point relates to the lesson that I suggested at, right at the beginning, that from Afghanistan, what we have learned painfully is that we as South Asia, Central Asia, Asia and the global community have all a common enemy, but we do not have a common strategy to defeat it. And this is the only way to defeat that enemy. I'm not going to provide an exhaustive list of elements of the, how that strategy should be shaped and what it should contain. But let me offer a few key points which need to be considered in developing that strategy. First, it's going to be a generational challenge. We cannot defeat terrorism in a year or two or in 10 years planning every time for one year. We need to plan for decades that enemy is not going to go away that soon. Second, we have to have, considering the experience from our region, action at four levels. 
global, Islamic world, regional and national. And we have to be able to coordinate our diplomatic, security, political and developmental assets in order to have action at four levels. What should we aim at when we are to develop a strategy at the four levels? The first objective should be to end state sponsorship of terrorism. There's no other way to defeat terrorism unless we end its sponsorship. There are states that support terrorism and there are elements within states. We often hear from the international community it's difficult to designate a state as sponsor of terrorism because there are many implications. Well, first it's disappointing that, that we do not have that courage. Second, even if we do not have that courage to designate a state let's designate individuals that are sponsoring terrorism and hiding behind the state. International accountability will have to. It's been long that it has gone beyond just states and it's holding individuals accountable on human rights, but let's hold them accountable on their support for terrorism no matter which states they are working for. Second, it has to be a coordinated response of the intelligence, military, diplomatic to remove sanctuaries and the support infrastructure including financing, training, recruitment and equipment. third level is national action. We agree with those who believe that in addition to doing things about terrorist organizations, we also need to address the internal dynamics, the fertile ground for terrorism. And there are th three things from our experienced colleagues that matter the most improving governance, addressing poverty, and improving educational systems, among the many other priorities. These will have immediate and decisive impact on terrorism. Our current engagement against terrorism with the United States and NATO will definitely require additional regional help. Finally, peace and reconciliation. Again from the Afghan experience. Afghan peace and reconciliation will be the most effective counterterrorism strategy in the region and beyond the region. If you remove the Afghan terrorists away from the regional and global terrorists, they will not have a sanctuary in that region. So therefore, peace and reconciliation legitimately pursued with the Afghans will have an immediate impact on regional and global terrorists. With this, colleagues, I did warn you that it's going to be a long speech, but I hope I have contributed a little bit. Thank you so much.